Let's get started. Hi everyone, my name is Jordan Cruz and today's panel is a fifth annual Bridging the Gap event. I'd like to start off by saying thank you to Jessica Dang, Alumni and Peer Engagement Officer from Class of 2016 for helping to organize the event. We are in this together. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Sky Hazel. Sky Hazel is a senior entrepreneurship and information system analytics double concentration, president of Advanced Evolution, townhouse resident assistant, and student manager in the Center for, Div for Diversity and Inclusion. Sky Hazel. Thank you, Jordan, and hello, and thank you all for joining us today. As Jordan mentioned, my name is Sky Hazel, and I'm going. I'm honored to be moderating today's panel. I'd like to give a special thanks to all of today's panelists and the alumni who are here to share insight, guidance, and advice on your experiences as a Bryant student and your tr transition into your career. I will have our panelists introduce themselves shortly. First, I want to review the format of today's event. We'll, we're gonna go through a series of questions and allow each panelist to share their responses. Then we'll open the chat to a few questions and answers and you can also unmute yourself and we'll, we'll give you a heads up when we're transitioning. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to our panelists to begin. Please share your name, where you're from, degree that you earned, year of graduation, involvement you had on campus in your current job or career. And I know it's a long list. I, I can paste that in the chat if anyone, <laughs> anyone missed one. You're gonna have to keep us on track. Um, Scott. <laughs> I'll kick off if that's okay. Um, Evelyn Hayes, um, I'm, a, I'm originally from New York. Um, I think to be honest, you know, you hear all the time that New Yorkers like don't really travel that much. And I remember that going to Bryant, getting dropped off was like a, such a major um, event for us, which is kind of uh, funny. Uh, when I think back on it now. Um, so um, I currently live in Connecticut. I graduated from Bryant in 2002, uh, which is, you know, you think about it, it feels like so long when I say it out loud, but it feels so near based on the experiences that I had, wonderful experiences there. Um, I currently work at Citigroup. I'm a chief auditor there covering um, the institutional clients group, the technology that supports that core business. Um, I've had quite a journey since leaving Brian. I'm sure that we'll go uh, through that as we go along. Did I cover everything, Sky? I think so. <laughs> Can you say what things you were involved in, Evelyn? What, what groups? Oh yeah, so I was um, I was a resident assistant uh, when I think uh, yeah after my first year I became a resident assistant. I was on the dance team as well. Uh, I was part of the Multicultural Student Union as well. And I forget all the other little clubs that I joined. Well, I think I will go next, but I think I'm the uh, next uh, most uh, far graduate. I am Q Phipps um, from the city of Middletown, born and raised. I uh, graduated from Bryant University in class of 2005. I studied marketing and my minor was in political science. My master's is from Villanova University, which is an MPA and recent grad in the 2019. Uh, things I was involved in on campus, uh, student government. So I was a student senator for all four years. I'm 99% sure I was the first black student president um, in the history of Bryant, which I'm still really, really proud of. I took a lot of those skills into the real world later. I was an RA, I was involved in um, MSU also uh, with Evelyn. And I was involved in Delta Epsilon Chi. I was involved in that one of the marketing associations and probably a bunch of other organizations too. My big ones were student government and RA. Currently, I have four jobs because I have way too much time on my hands, apparently. I'm the director of advocacy for Excellence Community Schools, um, which is uh, New York's best um, charter, charter management organization in the state of New York and in Connecticut, which I'm really proud to, to serve on. I'm a parent advocate and help students with special needs. I am the director of, or co-director of Equity CT, which I'll put in the chat for anyone that wants to see our new nonprofit that does equity and education empowerment work with parents and families and students throughout the entire state of Connecticut. I am a adjunct professor at the University of Hartford, where I teach leadership opportunities and challenges. And I am a state representative for the city of Middletown District 100 and also the first um, black state representative in Middletown's history. And we're the, one of the 
five oldest towns in the entire state. So glad to be here with you all. And I have to follow that. <laughs> My name is Kevin Javier. I'm a graduate of 2012 from Bryant University. I'm originally from New York City. I currently live in Massachusetts uh, in the central part of the state in Worcester. Um, I uh, also graduated from my uh, master's program at Northeastern University back in 2016. While I was at Bryant, um, I had some of the re most rewarding years of my life. Um, you know, honestly had a you know, great experience in all these different clubs and organizations, including ISO, MSU, um, you know, Bryant Players, WJMF, um, Ambassadors, and I'm sure there were quite a few others that I can't remember anymore. Um, I was actually uh, the uh, chief editor of the Bryant Literary Review as well, which most students probably still don't recognize exists. <laughs> um, I am a, a recruiter. Um, I've been recruiting for the past eight years, uh, helping people find their uh, professional um, you know, uh, aspirations in, in terms of careers. Uh, I work for a corporation now called EBI Consulting. Um, and we are an architecture and engineering firm um, that uh, specializes in providing commercial real estate, due diligence, architecture and engineering, and environmental health and safety services. Um, but my career has taken me through uh, various um, stopping points, and I'll be happy to uh, address those a little bit later. Hi, everyone. Hi, uh, my everyone. name is Amy Waltz. I am um, originally from East Lyme, Connecticut. I graduated from Bryant in 2016 um, and really took what seems like an alternative route to a lot of the business people um, was studying science. So I currently am a fourth year PhD candidate at Kent State University in Kent, Ohio, um, where I'm focusing on cell and molecular biology and getting my degree there. Uh, at Bryant, I was probably in hindsight overly involved. <laughs> I was uh, definitely involved in MSU and ISO and um, with Extravaganza. I was on Advanced Dance Team at the time. I became a member of Zeta Phi Beta, Sorority Incorporated while I was there. Uh, my friends and I were setting up you know, our own female of color groups and our townhouses at the time. Like we were doing probably too much, but uh, but I had a great time at Bryant and I'd love to talk a little bit more about that in the sciences and where you can go next with that career. Okay, I guess I can go next. Um, my name is Alexandra Ortiz, um, you can call me Alex. Um, I'm originally from Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Um, I currently live in Dallas, Texas. So kind of a far way from home um, that I was brought here um, for work. Um, at Bryant, I majored in marketing and minored in supply chain in Spanish. Um, so when I graduated, I went into the Textron Leadership Development Program. Um, Textron's actually located in Providence, um, but they have um, different business units all over the country. So this program just hopped me around the country um, to kind of be within um, marketing and sales. Um, this past um, year, 2020, um, I graduated the program and actually switched over into supply chain. Um, so I'm a supply chain contracts professional um, in our sourcing group. So I kind of work a lot with um, our external suppliers um, and you name it, engineering, supply chain, finance um, to establish long-term contracts. Um, so I work for the, comp the business unit that makes helicopters, um, Bell Helicopter. So I'm not an engineering person at all, um, but I've learned how to collaborate with them. So um, at Bryant, I was a part of the dance team as well. Um, the one that did football, basketball and advance as well. Um, I was a part of Extravaganza, I co-directed. I was an RA and I gave some tours on campus. So it sounds like we were all overly involved, but it was definitely fun. And I'm excited to um, speak to you guys all. Okay, I guess I'll go last. I don't know how I'll be able to follow all that. Uh, my name's Nicole Kim. I'm originally from Jersey and I'm living in uh, New York City right now. Um, I graduated undergrad in accounting in 2019 and then um, from the MPAC program in the summer of 2020. Um, some things that I did on campus was um, I was captain of the volleyball team. Um, I was an ACE peer tutor and I also um, was on the e-board of Woke Athletes. Um, and I was supposed to work um, in like the financial services 
um, uh, at EY, Ernst & Young. And then I actually ended up like kind of switching my career path and I, I'm um, an account at Haymarket Books, which is like a nonprofit publisher. Awesome, thank you all for sharing. Uh, I know there's plenty of over-involved students that are here with us today who can relate to a lot of the stuff that you all said. Um, to reiterate for anyone who just trickled in, uh, this first portion is going to be discussion questions for all of our panelists. And then you're all going to have an opportunity to either drop in the chat or unmute yourselves at the end so we can do a Q&A. Um, but to start with our first question, uh, can each of you speak about your experiences at Bryant as multicultural undergraduates and how you've built a community at Bryant as a student of color? And anyone can feel free to start and chime in. I'm happy to go first on this one. Sure. So I think I had a pretty unique opportunity. My junior year of high school, I was uh, introduced to Bryant and invited um, to attend the PWC ACLI program. Um, and so, you know, I, uh, I did provide, I did participate in the PWC ACLI program. My, um, you know, my introduction to a lot of the great multicultural leaders on campus uh, was at that time. And, you know, I, I got to participate in the four mile program leading into my freshman year as well, um, which I know a, a number of you probably did as well. Um, you know, th that gave me uh, obviously a reacquaintance with some of those same community leaders, but a lot of new ones as well. Um, I think, you know, given the diversity of their involvement in campus, um, it really inspired me to become involved and, and kind of participate in some of those ac extracurricular activities that I quickly found myself, uh, you know, growing my network and, and becoming highly involved in. Um, eventually, I ended up taking on some leadership roles of my own through those organizations. So I'm very, uh, you know, uh, appreciative of, of those introductions. Um, so through those networks uh, of friends and acquaintances that I, you know, I had uh, during those programs, uh, I've kept in contact with a lot of them over the years, and, and I, I do feel like I still have a strong connection with Bryant this many years later. So I can add, um, really, I, can add I can add really quick, I feel like I'm going to come, there we go. Um, so I have always had like politics and governance and public administration in my heart. I've said I've been in student government since sixth grade. So I was at orientation um, at Bryant saying, hey, I'm q so I'm going to be running for student senate back in August. Yes, that is laughable because it seems absolutely ridiculous. I think some folks didn't even know that there was a student government and I was already running a campaign, right? Um, but what made it really easy for me was that on day one was that the uh, communities of color had already surrounded me, had already embraced me, uh, barely knew my name, didn't know where I was from, didn't know my platform, but we knew that on that particular campus, how important it was for us to stick together and support each other on our on one another's initiatives, and they just carried me on my back, or they carried me on their backs and just let me take off. And to be frank, most of my margins that I won by were typically by 10%. And at the time, the student of color population was exactly 10%. So the big difference was, was that the black and brown folks who were engaged, they came out and supported me unequivocally, and I've always won by 10%. And that method is the same method that I've used to win planning and zoning, to win a city treasurer, and then to win a state rep seat. Um, was starting off at home, so whether it was the black churches or um, the Middletown Racial Justice Coalition or any other traditional like black space or uh, spaces for communities of color, starting there and then building out the network into um, more white spaces. And, and that method has, has worked for me each and every time. The one thing I would just want to kind of just challenge you all on, because it's been really interesting to hear how different your experiences were, like to hear that there was woke athletes. Um, I said it, when I was there, because of, to be frank, how dangerous that place was, um, and like if you were an athlete, you were by definition woke because you had no other choice because of like the systemic oppression and racism that was surrounding us. Um, so someone specifically mentioned four mile program. So I would just challenge you to, if you don't know your history of Bryant University of why four miles started um, back in. So I was, I think it started officially with that name, I think probably like 2004. And if you don't know why it started, I would encourage you to ask others and find out and we could share and let's get, give me a call and we'll talk about it later. But there was a very, very particular reason for its um, inception. So to go from that in like the early 2000s 
to know that in 2020 there was woke athletes is just like mind boggling and really um, cool in progress, but also to know how much more work that campus has to do. Yeah, I'll echo uh, what key what you mentioned about community. I think um, coming in, um, to be honest, right, I'm from New York City. Coming in, it was uh, very. It, it felt rural. I mean, it's it wasn't, but you know, going from the big city to that, it was you know, it just felt that way. Um, but I I can tell you that I there was never a moment I didn't feel welcome, um, and. Um, there was a sense of community amongst the people of color there, you know, and that that was like my core group, you know, we hung out together, we, we found each other and obviously we made friends with all types of people, which is also really, really fabulous because, and that that's uh, for me personally, and I know everyone's had different experiences and different institutions, but at Bryant for me, yes, I had my core group of girls, I still, those are my best friends, I still have the same core group of friends. Um, that we still speak and we still engage and, you know, holidays and everything like that. Um, and I think what helped me to do that is really the engagement in some of the organizations and the clubs and um, the exposure that I got through uh, engaging in those um, activities that really propelled me to meet new people um, um, and get sort of engaged with uh, individuals that I probably normally would not have engaged with prior to that, right? So I think it's really important for me. Um, it really forced me to get out of my shell a little bit, um, but the exposure, I, I attribute a lot of my success now in terms of leadership to what I learned on that campus. I mean, just the way, just the re being a resident assistant, the training, um, you know, be, even being on the dance team, it's nerve wracking to get in front of a group of people and, you know, do a routine and you know you have all these different things but all those little components those uh those engagements little by little were sharpening uh me as a leader and really you know causing me to think differently about how i kind of interact with the world um i had an interesting experience that for me personally i never felt any different type of way um, I did see some of my friends go through things that I just was not exposed to. So it was a really strange thing because I didn't, you know, I, I don't, I can't relate to and say this happened to me, but seeing it was hard to, right? You see your friends going through it. Um, but overall, a fabulous experience. I, it's one of the best experiences of my life. And I was a transfer student, by the way. I used to go to Hunter College in New York City. Um, and talking to a couple of friends, guidance people, I changed my major and I decided to go to Bryant. And there's a whole backstory to how you even found Bryant. But um, so I was really only there for two and a half years, but those two and a half years for me shaped the trajectory of my future. And I really attribute that a lot to being at that university. And I have to give a shout out to Betsy McCabe. I almost, when I saw her join the call, I used to work at the president's office as well. And, um, let me tell you, great training, Betsy, really great training. And I saw you join, I almost had tears in my eyes because I, I really, I can't tell you enough how much I learned just working in, in that office. I guess I'll, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead, Alex. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll add to what's uh, been said. I also was a part of Four Miles, so I'm really intrigued by what the story is behind it, because by the time we were there, it was kind of just what the routine um, event was, and then the cruise, which was always fun. So, uh, but yeah, so I, I really, most of my time at Bryant was using these organizations I was a part of and trying to make friends out of those experiences, and then slowly moving up in those organizations. Um, I think the friend groups that I created, though they consistently shifted, they all are still really important. And there's towards the end, you know, you had your solid group, and and that solid team is still uh, still my my friends, still my good friends to call and talk to, um, and so they were important in that. I think in creating those spaces, it was really about creating somewhere safe and somewhere you could complain and cry or just watch, you know, music videos, like just the all around groups. And so I think that's how we found um, each other and found this community slowly building up uh, because it was just us. It was just us being us in these spaces. To be honest, we also used um, 
the like multicultural center to really have a lot of these startup conversations and really just being in that space together and seeing who's walking through. Uh, and that's where I met a lot of people and got in touch with a lot of people and started building that network even more. So I think as much as it changed over time, all of these spaces ended up playing a huge role in how I built what was, what was my community at Bryant. Um, and so it was, it was a good experience. It was a good experience. Yeah, I just kind of will add to that. Um, like all of us, I think my best friends come from the Four Mile um, program and we're still best friends to this day, even though we've all moved around. Um, but I came in, I'll back up before I didn't even want to come to Bryant originally. I wanted to move to New York City. Uh, I wanted to get out of Rhode Island and just experience life. Um, and then it came down mostly to what do I actually want to achieve from this undergrad um, and also I kind of wanted to be close to home in case I had to commute financially or anything like that. Um, but when I first moved in as a freshman, I kind of split my time between Four Mile and um, the dance team camp. So I kind of made teams that way. Um, I think the difference would be is I actually went to Catholic school my entire education until um, college. So I was kind of used to being the minority in my classes. So it wasn't really a shock moving to Bryant. Uh, but then when I met people at Four Mile that were Colombian or um, Dominican, it was like kind of shocked to me, like, oh my God, I'm going to school with people who look like me. Um, but there's like that, those two versions where, again, we just kind of hung out together. Um, I didn't really start hanging out at the Multicultural Center until maybe junior, senior year, which I regret now. But I think I was just so involved with um, the daily studying, working, dancing. Um, but towards the end, it was just kind of, you got to bring other people who didn't even know what the PDAC center was um, into there and say, you can get free food that they sometimes have or just collaborate. So yeah, I think it's just important that you touch base with everyone and kind of just go into a space that made you feel safe and to learn um, meet new people, so. Um, yeah, I guess. Mm -hmm. Everyone had like the four mile experience but because I played volleyball, um, I'd always be in preseason. So my team was always, or like my family was always my team. Um, so I feel like I really had a community of like students of color really up until Woke Athletes started um, my junior year and I was able to be on the e-board and a like, shout out, I think Lillian Spud are here. Um, yeah, so that was like really amazing that we were able to do that and like build like more of a community of like athletes of color. Um, and just like figure out like what was important to us and like creating a safe space for us. Um, and also shout out to Dr. Um, Kevin Martins. He like invited me to um, a book club that he was running freshman year. And that really sparked my interest in just like more like radical thinking and like just learning and education. And I think that's definitely like led me on the path where I am today, like working at like a nonprofit film publisher. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing. Thank you for the communities that you built, just like Q said, which allowed us who are students now to also build on that, just like Nikki was talking about with um, woke athletes and, you know, stuff like that would not have been possible without the community that you all built. Um, so the next question we have, uh, what skills or competencies would you encourage those in the audience to focus on while in school? I'll just kick off here because I think um, you know one of the things when I when I interview candidates and and um, um, and I'll just back up you know at City the way we rate performance is based on two factors it's like what you do and then how you do that and the how is often um, equally or even more important than what you actually execute um, and you know I say that to kind of emphasize that all the things that we're saying here and I guess you know everyone in this group are people that like to get really really involved is that you know when you do get engaged is think about how you're developing as a leader um, leadership skills to me by far when I look across the people who have been very successful in my team um, and and, the, and it's about the all the little unspoken things, you know, how you come across, how you present, how you communicate, how you communicate your thoughts, how clear you are. All those things need to come together. And I really strongly believe that all the um, resources that um, students have available at Bryant create an avenue to get that. Um, 
and talked about the resident assistants uh, being a resident assistant. And you, you kind of, you know, you, you have a sense of responsibility. There is, you know, often a training that we had to attend and it would teach us some of those things. I had never been exposed to anything that challenged how I thought about, how I would approach an individual. Um, so I would emphasize that, you know, I think if I could just pick one thing, I would say, when you do engage in these programs, think about how is this sharpening me as a leader? What are the things I need to engage in to understand where I am in terms of being a leader? Because I do believe that um, you don't have to have a title to be a leader. You are leading right now where you are. You're leading something and you're projecting something. Um, so that's, that's what I would leave with is really sharpen and think about how you engage um, and sharpen your leadership skills to prepare you for the future. So there's three quick things I would add. Um, one, I think the Bryant community already instilled a sort of sense of community, right? So when you're working and when you're doing things together, you're always bringing someone else with you, right? So when you hear about enrolls, you're going to tell your class, or you're going to tell your friend, mate, come join this with me. If it's a dance team, you're going to tell someone, hey, come join the dance team with me. Like that togetherness and that sense of camaraderie is like, and camaraderie is super important. Um, as you move on. And that's something that I guarantee you, you will learn at Bryant. And if you bring that with you to other spaces, because there's very few other people that do that. There's so often folks will take the path alone. So you will stand out if you are doing the work and bringing and empowering others to do the work with you. So definitely take that on. Um, the second thing I will remind you is that Bryant is also will give you both a good sense of judgment on just how great you are and how many things you have to work on. And by that, I think you will see a lot of mediocrity around you. I won't say who, but we'll just, we'll let you ascertain that on your own. But the fact of the matter is, is that whether you are in grad school, whether you're in the corporate world or politics or nonprofit world, wherever you go, um, you will be well prepared. Trust me, you'll be, and you will probably be able to outshine a heck of a lot of the other people out there. And you probably have witnessed that even in your own classes now. Um, so you don't have to worry about the imposter syndrome. You don't have to worry about whether or not you fit. You are well prepared, you are ready to go and just go and just do the darn thing. The last part I will say is this, figure out the skill or, or framework or mentality, whatever it is. And there's a, there's a uh, 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 idea in, in the fighting game community to say like, get good, right? Like just be the best that you can at that particular thing. Um, and I will say that while I was never the best academia and my GPA is trash, I'll tell you that it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. Um, however, um, the community organizing that I learned as a um, student senator, I am literally probably one of the better political strategists in the entire state of Connecticut in the legislature. I can tell you that for a fact, and those skills I prepared at student senate in Bryant. I 100% promise you that. And like being able to stay calm in a like crazy situation, the best training for that in the entire world is being an RA. So when something's like, like when there's literally a tree on fire and someone is throwing up an alcohol, poisoning everything else and everything and everyone's relaxed. And you're like, you're just perfectly relaxed because you've been trained to do so. Trust me, it helps out in the corporate world. I'll never forget being in the bank and there was like $10,000 missing. Everyone was like, oh my God, and they're running all around and crazy. And they're like, why are you so calm? I'm like, is anything on fire? Nope, is anyone about to die? Nope, it's money, we'll find it. And that really changed the entire culture of my center and changed how it was seen in that entire bank. Can I just echo the part you said, uh, Q, about being your best at what you do? Oh my gosh, that is so fundamental. And I think we don't give ourselves enough credit sometimes at what you're good at. And you can train, train, train all the things you don't have, but what about what you can do? Focus on what you can, double down on that. Thank you. If we could get maybe one more response to this question, just for time's sake, wanna make sure we get to all the participants' questions at the end too. Yeah, I can. I think for, <laughs> I think um, the only thing I would add is just really having confidence and pride in what is your opinions, thoughts, and ideas. Um, I think sometimes that can come off a little arrogant, but there is this idea that um, we always have to like mold our opinions to, to some things. And I don't always find that necessary. Sometimes people are waiting for you to really stand in your thoughts and defend those thoughts so that you can get um, the respect and opinion from other scholars, uh, specifically in the field that I'm in. 
with that, I also think there is this caveat to being open to change your thought based off of new information. And I think it's important in general, but I also think it's important when you're in these careers because there is always gonna be something new that you need to learn or need to be aware of or use as a part of um, your structure, how you attack a situation and to know that you can be confident in your opinion and still change your thought based off of new information is really critical to that um, learning that's supposed to happen in these careers. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have, uh, in your current companies, how have they addressed issues on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Are there any intentional shifts in policy or practice pertaining to DEI, for example, recruitment, policy, statements, et cetera? And we can start with Nicole, Alex, or Kevin for this one. Yeah, I can start off. Um, well, to be completely honest, like my organization is like a pretty radical, like left book publisher. So um, just in general, like the books that we publish, like are already kind of on like, like liberation of like oppressed folks, like that kind of thing. So like, and also like on the bigger topics of like capitalism and like imperialism. So like in general, I would say that like, we never really have big issues with like these kind of things, like not having like enough, like, um, people of color like in the workforce or like earn the company like that kind of stuff so I feel like in this particular question like my company does a pretty good job um like it's, and it's always like in our thought process like how will certain communities like receive this book or like what do like people like need to be reading and stuff like that so my company so is uh, my com quite on the opposite end of that spectrum so I do want to uh, share my uh, my story here so uh, you know the company that I work for is in the architecture and engineering space and no fault to my own company, um, but that particular profession uh, tends to be um, white males, right? And, uh, and it's very difficult for us to find diversity uh, in terms of the professionals in that space. Um, fortunately for the company and for myself, um, I am a recruiter, a talent acquisition specialist for um, you know, all the positions that we have ranging from, you know, the, the lowest level entry level positions all the way up to senior and executive levels. Um, so one of the things that we have uh, always had in mind is, you know, how are we going about our recruiting efforts and how are we focusing on uh, DEI initiatives uh, when, when it comes to recruitment? And we've, we've had an emphasis on HBCUs um, for the last two years, at least. Um, we've made uh, some strides in getting involved with other organizations that can help us to get the word out there to, um, you know, diverse, uh, I guess, uh, clientele uh, candidates. Um, but also we've kind of developed some training in-house to inform our managers of ways in which the job descriptions may be in fact turning away people of color or may be in fact, uh, you know, discouraging women from applying. Um, you know, we're also uh, engaged, committed uh, financially. So the company has addressed diversity and inclusion as a an, uh, high level uh, initiative for our goal of reaching, um, you know, in 2025, we have identified uh, at least five of those HLIs that are important to us as an organization if we're going to see organizational growth. And so, uh, you know, the financial commitment is important because without that financial and executive support, uh, it's very difficult to put these practices in action. Um, so I think that's, a, that's an important starting point. Um, and the company is, is doing what we can to, uh, to reach the DEI initiatives we set forth. Yeah, and just to echo off that, um, my company down here um, is located in the DFW um, complex. So it's kind of very diverse in itself. So they try to um, hire locally as well, um, but they also bring in, um, whether it be interns or from my specific program so that they can um, train us from the beginning up. Um, but what Kevin was saying, the HR team um, is composed of many different teams, but they actually have a team specifically for diversity and inclusion, um, which is great because my first rotation was actually at a smaller location in kind of the middle of nowhere PA. Um, so it was a little different of the diversity aspect, but our company is kind of showing an example to our other business units of what could be done. 
Um, so we kind of, we have um, employee resource groups. Um, so kind of like the groups on campus um, where they have one for um, Latinos, they have one um, for African American um, population. They also have one for the LGBTQ community. So it's not more of, um, it's definitely a safe space, but it's kind of more of um, groups that to um, educate the rest of our workforce um, and make everyone feel welcome if they wanna learn something. Um, but it's definitely an initiative of our company. Um, obviously it can be better, but one of the initiatives that they're doing is kind of going out and recruiting at um, the historic black colleges, which um, believe it or not is kind of a little bit newer for our company, um, but they're seeing that that's talent is coming from there. Um, and so that's an initiative they're working on. Thank you. And the next question that we have is how can students of color prepare themselves for the workforce, especially working in predominantly white companies or organizations? I will start that, that one. <laughs> I am a still a strong supporter of this organization. So if you study business, communications, accounting, uh, I'm trying to think of nursing, I don't think we have nursing at Bryant yet, um, computer sciences, and you have not applied for inroads yet, I will not help you um, try to get a job. That is a basic standard for every single Bryant student uh, that is a student of color. You have to at least apply. If you do not have a story where you at least try to apply, and that's www.inroads.org, I will not help you because I feel like that is a clear conversation that every single student of color has with one another about this internship. It's a paid internship in your field. They teach you how to dress, how to write your resume, cover letters, interviewing. They put you in a Fortune 500 company, and then once you're there for two or three summers, you have a guaranteed job. It is one of the easiest ways to be able to launch your career um, before you even start. And I know many of us, I know Aliana, speaking of which, Aliana, who is um, here today, um, who was the one that told me about the program back in 2001, 2002. And I want to give her a special shout out because she is like single-handedly um, one of the best organizers and people that empowered others in Bryant's history period, no matter what race, no matter what gender, Aliana has supported many of us to this day. Even the fact I just texted her and was like, I just wanna say hi and just say thank you for everything that you did. And she jumped right on, which because again, she is clearly someone that cares about supporting others. So I wanted to give her a special shout out. But one of the ways that she uh, most helped my life was telling me about En-ROADS because that launched my career. And I know I was making $15 an hour back in 2002, 2003 as an intern. So it is a life changing organization so at the bare minimum, make sure you, you start to launch a career from there. And whether you stay at your company or not, that is a good foot in the door and your career will be launched. I promise you that. I was actually part of Inroads as well. Um, I'm glad that you actually um, brought that up because Kevin Martin's actually had a rep come from Inroads my sophomore year. And that's actually when I went to go speak with them. Um, and through Inroads, I, excuse me, there's a fly going. Um, through um, inroads, I had um, two year two two summer internship um, with MetLife in Rhode Island, um, and then from there they actually wanted me for a third year, um, and I could have worked there um, afterwards. Um, it was all my own personal decision to get different experience, um, but like speaking to that, inroads was a a great way to just go to trainings and meet people from um, New England as well in different industries. Um, but in those trainings, they talk about how it is to be a multicultural student going into a predominantly white area, um, how to, the basics of how to how to um, how to dress, how to be in interviews, etc. So that was a great starting point. Um, so yeah. Just to piggyback off of those two, um, you know, I, I think it's really important to use as many services and, uh, you know, ins as you can possibly um, to get yourself uh, launched forward, right? And uh, there's a benefit, believe it or not, to being a person of color. So take advantage of those opportunities. And, um, you know, I, I also think that sometimes you may be faced with bias. You may have to work a little bit harder than your white counterparts, but be your best self. You made it to Bryant. You're at one of the, you know, prominent organizations in the Northeast. Um, take advantage of that and really sell that. Um, you know, I think that's really important to do. Uh, and you'll find that, you know, organizations will appreciate you for the, uh, you know, professionalism and, and uh, you know, all, all of the things that you can bring to the table. And I, I wasn't part of En-ROADS um, when I was at, uh, at Bryant, but uh, I recall 
the Multicultural Student Union used to have these networking events where they would bring alumni back to just give talks. And um, I got a job out of that, out of a meeting. <laughs> so um, uh, what I'm saying is network. And I think everything that everyone has said here in terms of like, leverage your resources, there's so many of them. Um, find those networking opportunities, get that exposure. Cause you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of your um, success, yes, will come from great performance, uh, but a lot of it is who you know. Um, so don't discount that as well. One, sorry, I just want to add to that, Evelyn. Don't just collect the business card, right? Um, make sure you make that call and ask, how do I get into your company, right? And they, there will be people to help you. Absolutely. Thank you for those answers. Uh, just a reminder for all the participants, we're getting to our last couple of questions. So think about all your burning questions that you wanna ask the panelists. Um, the next question, so thank you all for answering that. How do we prepare ourselves? And now this is more of a, what do we do while in the situation question? So as multicultural professionals, have you ever experienced issues related to bias at work? If so, what's what steps did you take to address the experience? Yeah, I can, yeah, uh, I can answer this question. I think I definitely have uh, experiences, experienced biases. I think as a black woman in the sciences, um, we are going against a lot of the stereotypical, you know, who is a scientist idea. I it's been difficult. I, I won't lie. Like I, there's days where it is difficult to realize that um, within the lonely space of graduate education, you are that much more lonely than some of the other um, individuals around you. However, I think I found some ways that I've best addressed it. And part of it is embracing uh, my differences. And I think it kind of goes back to how people answered the last question where it's like, okay, cool. You guys notice I'm black too, great. We know that I'm a, I'm a woman too, okay, great. What money is out there for this woman who is black and is studying these sciences? And how do we make sure that she is fully financially supported so that she can get through this academic program? Uh, and I think being a little more confident in myself and also being very blunt with my advisors just to say, yeah, no, I, this is what I want you to look at this. I don't want you to shy away from the fact that I'm black. Don't shy away from the fact that I'm a female in this space. How do we, how do we capitalize on this? How do we make some money so that I can get this research done and take some time from other things? And that's been really helpful. Um, and it's also been helpful because in me doing that, I've been able to find even my own resources outside of funding just to get into different groups that were also going to support me, um, which is other females, other people of color and sciences within this Northeastern Ohio region, uh, being a part of scholarship programs and fellowship programs through national organizations that are looking at neuroscience and just getting my name out there has been really helpful. But it took me to kind of take in that idea that, okay, we can't change what everyone is trying to make awkward. And I'm gonna use it. I'm going to use what is, what is my now platform since everyone notices it anyway. Um, and has made it, it made an issue in some places, but this is how I'm going to step into this. I can kind of go after that. Um, I personally haven't experienced bias on my end in the corporate life, um, but there's those little microaggressions that I think we're all um, aware of um, when there's in communication. Um, I take it in the approach of kind of taking a step back and trying to see um, it wasn't really meant in a in that type of tone of way. Um, and then from there, I actually goes to my supervisor, um, my peer, um, or someone in HR, um, if you're in the corporate lifestyle, to kind of speak to them about this. Um, but definitely don't be quiet about it um, because I'm pretty sure someone else has also experienced that as well. Um, so I would say speak up um, and don't be shy about it. Like Christina said, um, take advantage that you are the only Latina on your team, or you are um, not the majority. Um, there's just a lot of opportunity for you um, in those spaces. And I'll have a quick um, show of vulnerability. So there's a fine line between being fired and quitting. And I have had that fine line four times at least. Um, but the thing that finally made it stop was 
several things. One, being able to create my own space and saying, I'm like, that's when I became a, a state rep, right? I'm no longer going to continue to play your games. I'm not going to wait my turn. I'm not going to get put in the box you think um, I, as a Black man, should be in. I'm going to define that for my own self. And um, again, ever since I've done that, things have gotten a lot better. Or um, going into spaces where there are also leaders of color. So the school that I work for, Excellence Community Schools, um, is run by the leading educator in the entire um, country, uh, Dr. Charlene Reed, a black woman from the Bay Area. And being under, being under a black woman's leadership with a pretty much a predominantly um, team of color, I think there might be one leader in the executive team with us. Um, having that sort of space and being led by people of color makes it a lot harder to have biases because once again you can you don't have to explain things but also it doesn't happen because we're all the same right um where whereas in other spaces you have to first go have to go and explain educate um to even defend oftentimes and when you can cut all that sort of stuff out right it makes your life a heck of a lot easier so i'm not but i'm not saying you have to quit or get fired every single time but i will say that you um you do not have to be gaslit anymore you do not you can acknowledge the truth and then just make sure you are finding the right fit for yourself um, and prioritizing your own like health and happiness over money and um, titles oftentimes. Yeah, I just, if I could just add very briefly, I think from what everybody said, one of the things, um, you know, I've had many experiences, especially being, you know, I'm a career auditor um, and, you know, I remember when I transitioned into the technology space, and I was pretty much, you know, not many women in that niche. And, and then if you go into technology, but then you're covering a specific part of financial services, it gets even smaller. So that you get, it, it sort of gets really micro. And, um, you know, I remember going into those situations and looking, I remember being on meetings and it's, you know, it's mostly white, older men. I was the youngest person and a female and Latina, you know, and I was sitting there and I was, I was like, I'm freaking proud. I'm like really proud that I'm sitting at this table. So, and I say that to say that, yes, there is a lot of projection that can come, but your diversity, your traits, your differences and things that you bring to the table, they have value. And you have to recognize that value, not just recognize and know what you have, but then you have to harness it and make it something. Um, and I think that's just kind of just enveloping everything that some of the folks that here is uh, that is just be proud. I mean, you're going to be exposed to things and brought into certain situations where you will be the trendsetter. Yes, maybe you'll be the first one, but guess what? You're setting the tone. You are setting a new path and be proud, you know, walk in it, own it and go forth. Thank you. And the last question that we have for you for now is what advice do you wish someone had given you at the start of your career that you would offer now? And we definitely want every single one of you to give, give us your best advice on this question. I could start. Um, so I guess for me, I've like only really been like working like full time um, since like January. So I'm a little bit newer to this, but I've been doing internships since like my sophomore year. Um, and I guess what I would say to someone is just like, kind of like live like your life outside of work. Like don't make your like career and your work like your whole entire life. And if there's something that you're like really passionate about, like go for it and like like you don't have to follow like I guess like a career path or like at least for me for accounting like it's always like oh like get your master's CPA big four and then after that like you're you're set um that's like the path that I was definitely on um but I would say like if you're really passionate about something like go do something else because that's just what's gonna make you happy in the end yeah I'll echo that um the expectations I would of course, everyone has their own expectations of where they're going to be when they graduate, um, but don't set such high expectations on your first role. Um, it could be something that you want to do or you don't want to do, um, but early career, you're really just um, gaining that experience. Um, my first year, it was a lot of financial pricing and I absolutely hated it, but I found out I hated it. So I kind of had to do it and now I realize that it's within my role right now. I realize that I'm really good at analytics. Um, Although 
the creative path is more of my passion, I realized that my strong suit is more analytical. Um, so I'm just using that to my advantage. But yeah, going off of that, just don't set so much expectations and just kind of be open to what opportunity may um, land in front of you. I would say, um, you know, one of the early things, I think it was about seven years into my um, audit career that I finally got a mentor. And I just didn't realize how many blind spots I had. Um, you know, at, at that moment, I remember like one of the early discussions, we started talking about pay. And I realized like how different my pay was compared to some of my fellow colleagues and stuff. And, you know, it really, you know, and that was like the first time I actually had to speak up and say, I think I'm worth more money, right? Um, how would I had that conversation before? I don't know if I was thinking about it. So sometimes you need someone else and it doesn't have to be necessarily a, men a mentor, some sort of an accountability uh, partner or something that, uh, you know, your circle of people, you know, they always kind of have all these different terms of, you know, who is around you, who is bringing you up, who is pulling you up. You need those individuals to, um, to kind of continue to help you grow and just remind you of things that you may not be thinking about um, that you should be. Um, and also kind of a safe space to kind of be vulnerable and um, share some of the things that you're looking to work on as well. So that's been a great um, development uh, tool for me uh, over my career. And I offer it to, I mean, I, I love coaching people. I love being a mentor, but it's a two-way street. It's a conversation. I learn just as much from mentees as, uh, you know, from my mentors as well. So it's something I advocate a lot uh, with uh, junior folks and just anyone in general, really. And whether you're, you know, um, just about to graduate or you're still a little ways away or you've already graduated, um, you may not know what you want to do with your career. Right. Uh, and that's OK. It's totally fine to not know for sure where you're going to be five, 10 years from now. Uh, in fact, it's uh, it's a benefit. Right. Uh, because throughout your career, you're going to be exposed to new ideas and new philosophies, new ways of doing things. Um, and it's important to be able to be flexible and be able to pivot. Um, and take advantage and take, you know, take ownership of, you know, some of those strengths that you have, um, which you may not recognize right now. They may not have exposed themselves just yet. So, you know, be on the lookout for those strengths to, uh, you know, really uh, show themselves and then be able to pivot and, uh, and go that direction. Yeah, I think uh, two things come to mind. One, um, like really praise, celebrate your accomplishments. Like, take a second and enjoy that moment because I think sometimes we get so tied up into what's next and like, what's the next thing I have to do that you forget to really celebrate what's happening in that moment. Um, and then you don't really get a chance to do it later on. So like take those moments, like when you do graduate, enjoy that graduation. Like you actually made it through four years of education and everything else and whatever that next career is, enjoy those moments. And sometimes I heard someone tell me the other day, they're like, start a document and, you know, make a folder of like great comments you get and comments you get from your students and people who tell you like that you're doing well at things because every once in a while you need that boost. And sometimes being able to reflect on those things that you've done really well on um, help you kind of push forward and when it's difficult which kind of leads me to my second point, which is it is hard. <laughs> I think there's a, a part of me that wanted the advice of honesty that it's it's difficult. This, this road is difficult and it's hard for everyone. I didn't miss the innate skill that made this easy for somebody else. Like it really is just a difficult process. You being an undergrad is already difficult. Anything you do after this is gonna be hard too. Um, and sometimes that it gets easier over time. Sometimes it's just the learning part that is difficult, but it's okay that it's difficult and it's okay that you're struggling with it. It's okay to ask for help with it. I think all those are important because sometimes we really fall into that imposter syndrome um, so easily because it seems as if it's weird for it to be difficult for us um, or as if we've missed something because it's difficult for us. And I just don't believe that's true. I think it's, it's actually hard. <laughs> it is by itself hard. And so really just appreciating what that is and appreciating what you're doing in that moment of difficulty, uh, I think would be really important. And I will share that it is, um, you always want to try to like do your, your passion, right? So make it do, like, do what you love. And if you can try to make a career on what you love, it makes it a lot easier to go to work. I will also say that is a privilege. 
it is a blatant privilege, privilege that 99% of the working population will never be able to have. So while you want to aspire to be able to do so, the main thing you want to do is be able to work towards that. But that is a goal, um, that is a journey, but that is not a success, not a necessarily an idea of um, success or failure. Um, but the, I think that the aspirational side is the more important part. And this, I think, I think the real world or the working world, again, it is designed to like tire you out. It's designed to judge you by what you produce. Um, and that is not healthy for any of us. Once again, our people and our culture um, have never valued that. Not, not that we haven't valued production, but we valued things more important, right? Family, working together, community and cooperation, unity, um, education, uh, sharing, humility. Like those are the things that we um, have valued more than every along beyond the size things of like producing more, who's stronger, who's more powerful, what titles you have. So recognize that those are all forms of oppression and you have to get there so that you can, um, in order to change, in order to change those systems of oppression. But I think the more important part is, is that um, being able to produce and to work while you love it will make you all much more healthier and happier person. And generally speaking, it will probably make you a lot more rich too once you get there. And I'm gonna leave my cell phone number in the chat for everyone and once again, feel free to give me a call or text if you ever need anything and they can help out with it and partner with. I said, I, I love talking as you can see. That's literally the same number that my wife and my mother call. So it's my real cell phone number. Thank you all for sharing. It looks like we have two minutes um, for q and I know we do have some panelists who do have to drop right at one. Um, and also, I'd like to invite all of the alumni, if you'd like to share the link to your LinkedIn um, or any students that please go right ahead, reach out to the alumni on LinkedIn. I'm sure they'd love to continue this conversation, uh, assuming, but I'm pretty sure they wouldn't mind <laughs> hearing from us on LinkedIn. So um, just to open it up, does anyone have any questions? You can drop them in the chat or unmute yourself. I had a question. Um, so hi, I'm Daniel Vital. Um, especially for like, um, I'm a resident assistant. So sometimes I struggle with having um, my residents engage with some of my um, programs since I have tried like promoting more um, black ideas. So how have you guys been able to um, engage people um, with your uh, programs or have any ideas on how to engage people um, in those programs? Uh, that was always a problem for me as well. So you're not alone. I think um, we're required to do um, some events um, to get our residents in. And the fact of the matter is that some might not come, um, but I think word of mouth really helped um, in my aspect because you can send all the emails you want, post um, whatever flies you want, but you kind of want to walk around and say, hey, did you hear about this? Or would you be interested if I did um, a program like this? So I think it's more about talking to your residents to see what they would attend. Um, but yeah, it's definitely difficult. So you're, you weren't, you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, I was going to add to that, Alex, as well. I think it's uh, maybe reaching out and seeing what, what they want to hear about or do or, you know, just kind of getting input from them. Um, Cause sometimes, um, you know, we would do, I can't remember how we went about it, but we would take like a survey or something um, in terms of the types of activities, whether it's giving them an option or even just getting open feedback in terms of things that they would like to see done. And then maybe formulating that into something um, broader. So maybe that might help. And sometimes you gotta like feed people the medicine and just put the sugar on it, right? And by that, Sometimes when you do racial justice work, just don't tell them that you're doing racial justice work, right? Like, I think there's a lot of ways to just spin it and let people get the education and then be like, be like, oh yeah, by the way, this helps people to go. Yeah, and just keep on going. And I think that's that really worked at our school where we have a lot of upper middle class white teachers that would swear up and down that they are not engaged in racial justice work. They would even call it, they would actually use white oppressive, like white supremacy language to explain what they do, how they just want to help the children and all this white savior 
nonsense. Um, and yet when you start to ask them about like what they're doing and why and how, they will use all the same sort of language that the black leadership and uh, Latino leadership uses to explain why this is actually racial justice work. So sometimes folks, you just gotta not only lead people to water, in some ways you gotta make them drink it and whether they not they know they're drinking water or gator, it is beyond the point. Thank you so much. I'll most definitely put all those ideas into my future events. Also, we're still monitoring the chat. I haven't seen one come in yet, but there was a student who had to leave for class who asked me to ask you all, um, how do you keep yourselves from overextending yourselves too much or taking on too much? So applying both to us being students right now and then also starting your career. It's a great question. I guess it depends on what it is that you have on your plate. Um, and look, I, I think I struggle with this a lot. Um, so I, I took on the, my, my role that I have now, I just started since January. So now I'm kind of trying to wrangle a global team and set them on my vision and my strategy from the prior person. And um, I'm learning a lot now that I don't have to do everything. Right. So there is a transition when you're going through and it, I guess I'm speaking in, in relation to promotion and things like that. But in your daily, you know, a book of work, if you if I can call it that you have to decide, do I need to be involved in all of these things? Or is there something that can be, for lack of a better term, delegated? Can someone else pick it up? Right. Um, and that's not an easy choice, but it's certainly something that you have to intentionally do. Otherwise, uh, inevitably, it does lead to burnout. Yeah, Evelyn, that was great. Yeah, you know, I want to add to that, that, you know, I learned very early on in my Bryant's career when I started off my freshman year and was in jeopardy of losing my scholarship because my GPA suffered so much in my, you know, first semester from being involved in eight organizations on campus. It's just too much, right? But it felt good. And I was, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was enjoying my time. The same thing can happen to you in the professional work environment as well. You get involved in too much, you take on too many projects and your work will suffer. And unfortunately, your manager will not be appreciative at that point of how many things you're involved in and how many you know people you were helping um, your work comes first and so you do have to prioritize you have to recognize what is important to the people around you what is important to your manager and what's ultimately going to keep you employed and try to overlap the things right so like i know in my life as a as a legislator um like my favorite event is Chocolate to the Rescue. It's a fundraiser for an organization that helps with homelessness, and it's also a chocolate and wine tasting, right? So it ends up being a way to help fight against homelessness. It's a way of supporting a nonprofit. It's a way of doing public engagement, and it's also date night, right? So there's multiple ways that if you can try to overlay these um, different commitments that you have, it's going to be a really uh, easy way to help make the numerous commitments that you're going to make as overly involved people that I think Brian helps kind of incorporate. It'll just make it it'll make it a tad bit easy, just a tad bit. I think we can take maybe one more question from any other participants. Um, actually, I just got a question, direct message in the chat. Um, the student wanted to ask what you all would recommend for students to get involved in terms of making strides for diversity, equity, and inclusion on campus. Starting to start, sorry, <laughs> just what strides um, would you recommend students make that want to um, get more involved in DEI efforts on campus? Um, I would say just kind of going um, into um, those spaces um, like the uh, cultural center and just kind of sitting there and to see what events are going on if you can get involved. Um, for me, I personally couldn't attend um, the MSU meetings because I was at work. So I it was just for me prioritizing where I could actually get involved. Um, so 
I got involved a lot with extravaganza. Um, that was my off season from dance. So I had more time. And so from there, that's kind of how I got involved to do something that I enjoyed, um, but also could take on some leadership um, with um, surrounded by um, multicultural students. Um, so just kind of seeing what fits for you, um, kind of echoing off what our last question was, prioritizing and trying to see um, how you can mentally stay sane, um, but also keep your studies um, or your job as priority. So. And I would say they don't, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think there are already so many programs that get connected with, you know, with, with the programs that are already there. Um, and it's, I think the more people you have um, getting behind it and propelling it forward, that's probably more beneficial. Um, so I'm not sure the nature of the question, but I would say get behind the things that are already there. And if that's really a passion for you, then, then that priority of saying, I'm gonna spend this time, even if it's incremental, every little bit counts. Um, so I would go from there. By being at Bryant, you're making strides, right? I mean, get involved in some of the organizations that you feel are predominantly white and that could use diversity, that could use equity, that could use inclusion, right? Um, I was a member of Bryant Players and I was one of the only people of color. I was the first person, I, as far as I know, uh, to have a Latino radio station on WJMF. Um, so, you know, just take advantage of the platforms that are already there. Take advantage of the fact that you already are at an institution like Bryant University and be yourself. Thank you. And we also got some great advice from Aliana in the chat. So um, <laughs> she said she was not a part of the panel, but we're still getting all this great alumni advice. Um, either way. And so to close, I'd just like to thank all the alumni for joining us today, for taking time out of your busy schedules, for all the panelists. Uh, we really hope, I'm sorry, <laughs> for all the participants. Uh, we really hope that you got a lot out of this. Please take advantage. Um, we have six panelists, but we definitely got more than just six um, LinkedIn links. So definitely take advantage of that. Uh, also, Jessica is going to share the link to the alumni fire, which was also mentioned in the chat a little bit. So it's a networking plat platform where um, we can network with alumni and all the alumni that were here today are going to be there. Um, extravaganza, that's also happening tonight at six. And for the alumni, there's a special watch party for you all at 5.30. So um, definitely attend those. And uh, I'd like to invite Jordan or Jessica to add anything else to close. I was gonna say thank you everyone for coming out here this afternoon, um, mainly on your lunch hour to come here from our panelists. It was such a good panel, such great advice. And I'm just really happy that you guys were able to make it panelists and, pan um, and participants in all. Thank you. I will echo Jessica. Um, at this time, it's the end of our Bridge in the Gap. If anyone wants to stay back, we can leave the Zoom open. Uh, I don't know if alumni have to go. I think there's still some students in um, in the Zoom, so maybe we can make it a little bit more intimate. But if you do have to go, um, this is the end of Bridging the Gap. Thank you, everyone.